Our next speaker, who is Marius Cornea from Intel, who is going to uh, say everything that uh, <laughs> be the opposite to, <laughs> to Jeff. Okay. Anyway, Marius, uh, take it away. Thank you. you know, uh, yes. Thank, thank you. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn off my video to avoid bandwidth problems. And I'll share my, my screen and hopefully that will work. Um, so please let me know if you can uh, see my... We can most definitely slide. see your slides. And I'll go into presentation mode and I hope that that will work. Yes. Does that work? Yes. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of presenting here today a topic which is truly important for Intel Corporation these days. Some people who are here today may have heard of it, maybe others not. It's the One API, which is led by Intel, but based on widely used industry standards. And it's aimed at creating a language and a programming model, which is... Um, which should make it easier for users to program once for many types of devices, Intel and non-Intel devices, hardware devices. Another important goal of One API is to enable achieving very good performance, mainly using optimized libraries. And an example of such a library is One MKL. Uh, we'll spend about uh, more than half the time today talking about One MKL. So the first few minutes will be about will be about One API. The creation of One API was prompted in great part by the growth in recent years of many specialized workloads requiring uh, different types of data centric accelerators. And today each kind of such hardware needs to be programmed separately using different languages, libraries, tool chains, uh, requiring users to maintain separate code bases as illustrated by the right side of this slide. Software development complexity limits freedom of architectural choice. So the Intel One API um, uh, was created to, to resolve this problem, to help solve this problem. The reference implementation that we have today supports Intel CPUs, GPUs, and Intel FPGAs, but additional Intel and, and other accelerator architectures will be added uh, over time. So, so for them will be added over time. <clears throat> this third slide changes a little bit what you saw as separate programming models for CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs on the previous slide, and that is replaced by the one API layer here. Uh, it's uh, about delivering a unified software development environment across CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and accelerator devices. It's, an, it's based on open, uh, open specifications and or standards for cross-vendor compatibility, actually. The next slide illustrates or details even more the middleware and uh, uh, firm, uh, frameworks uh, layers as the One API layer. One API includes a unified language and libraries that deliver full native code performance. It is meant to be the foundational programming stack layer used to optimize middleware and frameworks that sit up on top of it. The unified language for uh, one API is data parallel C++ or DPC++, which is an evolution of the C++ for data centric coding, allowing users to target multiple types of hardware with the same code. The low level hardware interface shown here at the bottom of the one API level and above the hardware devices Hardware devices, we refer to them uh, sometimes as XPUs, CPUs, GPUs, and so on, is the one API level zero uh, layer. And that defines a set of capabilities and services that a CPU, GPU, or hardware accelerator needs in order to interface with compiler runtimes and other developer tools. The Slide, this slide is dedicated to the data parallel C++ language and to the one API libraries provided by Intel. DPC++ is a programming language as mentioned based on ISO C++ on the Kronos SQL cross-platform abstraction layer for data parallelism and heterogeneous programming and also on community-driven enhancements. The set of libraries that we offer is 
includes one MKL, which is the one uh, API mask kernel library, one VPL for vector proce uh, video processing, one TBB for threading building blocks, one DPL um, data parallel C++ library works with the Intel DPC++ compiler, one DNN, which is the uh, uh, deep neural network library, one DAL for data analytics, and finally the one CCL library, collective communications library. Uh, the next slide talks about the product implementation of one API, uh, which Intel provides as the Intel one API toolkit, which is our reference implementation. It includes a complete set of developer tools for XPUs for advanced porting, analysis debugging. First, there is the one API based toolkit consisting of a set uh, of core high performance tools for building C++ and data parallel C++ application, applications. Second, there are a number of toolkits uh, for specific purposes for HPC, for AI, for uh, in, uh, IoT, uh, rendering, and so on. Third and last, we have toolkits which are powered by one API. Uh, one example is shown here, it's OpenVINO, which is a comprehensive toolkit for development of applications such as human vision, um, automatic speech recognition, natural language processing, and others. Um, the next two slides are uh, diving a, a bit more into a bit more detail for, uh, for the one API based toolkit. And you see here the uh, um, tools that we offer for direct programming, compilers, Python distribution, FPGA based toolkit, um, libraries and analysis and debug tools. And I won't spend much time on this one. The next slide is about the HPC toolkit, um, which is for high performance computing machine learning, deep uh, learning applications. Its components are identified at the top um, half of this figure. Uh, it, developers use it to build, analyze, optimize, or scale HPC applications for the latest techniques on, on vectorization, multi-threading, multi-node parallelization, memory optimization. And this toolkit is on top of the comes on top of the one API base toolkit. So you need the base toolkit in order to use the, the, the toolkit for HPC. Um, with this, we'll switch and talk about uh, what's the more important or, or long uh, lengthy part of our presentation. It's about the one MKL uh, mass kernel library. This is one of the more popular libraries used in HPC. It's a set of highly optimized threaded vectorized mass functions, which can be used to speed up computations for scientific engineering and financial applications. And it provides key functionality for dense and linear algebra applications with dense and, spar and, and sparse linear al algebra domains, BLAS, LAPAC, <clears throat> SPARDISO for FFTs, vector mass, vector RNG, summary statistics, and others. Not all are, are shown here. It has language support for DPC++, C, C++, and Fortran, and can be used with corresponding Intel compilers. It is optimized for single core <clears throat> vectorization and cache utilization. Automatic parallelism is included for multi-core CPUs and GPUs, and it scales from core to clusters. What are the goals of the Intel One API mass kernel library? It is, uh, first, it is an evolution of the Intel mass kernel library product, and it extends its long time optimized and Fortran language support with highly optimized mass functions common with common DPC++ APIs for multiple architectures and interoperability with existing HPC programming models on Intel CPUs and GPUs, which are using the standard MKL, Fortran, CN Fortran interfaces and OpenMP pragmas. And we'll see a number of examples. But this slide identifies in more detail the various functional domains covered by 1MKL. As shown in the picture, 
it has full support for CPUs in all the domains, all its domains, but limited support for GPUs at this time for Intel uh, GPUs. Four domains, BLAS, um, FFTs, uh, vector RNGs, and summary statistics have full support for GPUs, while the others have limited support or no support at all yet. But this is indicated by the color-coded contours that you see in this picture and indicated at the bottom of the slide. Well, uh, there is more than one MKL project, and this slide details the various projects that exist in this space. First, there is the one, M one API specification of one MKL, which defines the DPC++ interfaces for performance mass library functions. And there is a, a, a technical advisory board consisting of industry experts, which helps guide the one MKL parallel programming ecosystem. Second, we have the one API mass kernel library interfaces, which is an open source implementation of, this, of a subset of the specification. The goal of this project is to demonstrate how the DPC++ interfaces documented in the specification can be implemented for any mass library and how they will work on any target hardware. Third, and most importantly, probably, we have the Intel one API mass kernel library, which we have already introduced. Now, this is an example. And the two sides of this slide illustrate the control flow for the vector mass functions from the Intel 1 MKL library. Vector mass is one of its domains in two situations. For DPC++, when DPC++ is used on the left side of the, the slide, and when OpenMP offload is used on the right side. In the first case, the code is written in DPC++, while in the second case, it may be written in C, C, C++, or Fortran. In the OpenMP offload case, we also saw an extra layer, uh, OpenMP offload plugin layer, on top of the SQL runtime, which you see on both sides. Vector mass functions compute the same mathematical function on the, the elements of an input vector which is transferred to the device by the application and write the results on the output vector, usually of the same size of the input one. In both cases, a device queue is used, and this is the only connection which allows an application to direct work to be done to a device, in this case, a GPU. The library code is stored in SPIRV format, that standard portable intermediate representation, which is translated by the Intel graphics compiler into a GPU native binary. Then this is run with help from the backend, uh, level zero or other, OpenCL is an option, and the kernel mode driver sitting on top of the GPU in both pictures. So this is a control flow in the uh, in both cases. And this slide talks about how easy or difficult it is to program for one API using one MKL. Yes, there is a little overhead, but it should be worth it considering the advantages it brings. And the few examples of one APIs are shown here for the vector mass exponential function, EXP, just to keep things simple. <clears throat> the classic MKL API is in the top left corner. And it requires specifying the input vector, the output vector, their size, and an optional mode parameter, which can indicate, for example, the required accuracy of a function. The open MP offload case is shown on the top right, um, in the top right corner of the slide, is identical. But in this case, two pragma directives shown here at the top, uh, pragma OMP target uh, data map and uh, target variant dispatch device are used. So uh, to tell um, where to, process uh, these vectors on the device and the specific variant to be called for the device. The DPC++ API, <clears throat> bottom of the slide, has two variants. And it can use either buffers, an example is shown on the bottom left corner, or unified shared memory in the bottom right corner. 
We can recognize the input and output parameters again, in, if you look at the prototypes of these functions, and also an optional mode par uh, parameter from before. USM is pointer-based, and it should be familiar to C++ programmers. Buffers represented by the buffer template class describe one, two, or three-dimensional arrays. They provide an abstract view of memory that can be accessed on either the host or the device. Buffers are not directly accessed by the program and are instead used through accessor objects. In both cases, buffer or USM, the sickle queue is an additional argument which specifies the queue where the routine should be executed. So it's a first argument in both cases. In the buffer case, dependencies and other events are tracked implicitly, but in the USM case, you have a number of uh, optional parameters and depends is one of them. The depends argument uh, is a vector of dependent events to wait upon in order for the input data to be ready, for example. And finally, both forms take an error handler as a last argument, which we, did, we didn't see on the classic or OpenMP uh, APIs. The return value from the DPC++ API call is an event. So they do return an event, a SQL event, which can be used for profiling or for dependency tracking. And we'll see some examples. The next slide shows a real example of um, programming with these APIs. Corresponding on the left side uh, to the left side of the previous slide, um, but the, the classic API is shown on the right side of, of this slide, the classic API, C API, and the DPC++ API using SQL buffers on the left side. On the right side for the classic API, we define just the array of, uh, we define the, the size of n of the vectors or arrays containing input and output arguments. Then we define the input and our, uh, output arrays, and we invoke the single precision vector mass function exponential, uh, VMS EXP. And the M in the name of the function there indicates that there is a, an optional mode parameter used. In this case, it's VML LA, which tells the accuracy of the function we want to invoke. In this case, LA means errors will be no larger than four units in the last place or four ALPS. Now, on the left side for the DPC++ API, we also define in the same way the size N of the input and output vectors. But in addition, we also see how we create one dimensional buffers, A buff and R buff for the input and output arguments in, in this case. And the Q denoted here by the letter, small letter Q, we define a Q and the device. The function actually has a return value, a SQL event, but that's not used in this case. Again, we'll see examples where that uh, parameter or return value is used. The next slide is a similar example for vector RNGs. It's a DPC++, it uses a DPC++ SQL buffer API. We don't show the C, C API here. Uh, note that RNGs, random number generators, have several types of engines for creating random numbers in, in one MKL, Phylox, RS5, uh, MRG, other types, but we use a default one in, in this example. So it's selected for us automatically by the vector uh, RNG function. There are also several distributions, for example, uniform Gaussian, log normal discrete, but to use the normal distribution in this case. So we use a default engine and we use a normal distribution, uniform distribution. As in the previous example, we create a device uh, uh, denoted by dev here and also a queue. Then we initialize the RNG engine and distribution object, and we create a buffer named R buffer for the random numbers uh, generated by the vector mass function by the, the vector RNG function. And we uh, end with an invocation of the, the generate function, which fills the buffer with random numbers from the specified engine. Now, the next few slides may be even uh, more interesting, I hope. And they are, we have five examples for the 
gen or general matrix multiply function from one MKL, the one MKL domain. Gem is probably the most widely used function in one MKL in HPC and also one of the most optimized. This first example is for using the C API and it calculates uh, D equals matrices A times B times A as indicated in the top right corner. And for simplicity, simplicity, all matrices are square. We define <clears throat> the matrix sizes. Then we allocate space for the four matrices with malloc and initialize the matrices. Initialization is not shown here. Next, we invoke double precision C plus degen function. This computes in general alpha times A times B plus beta times C. But in, in this case, alpha is one and beta is zero. So we simply compute A times B in this, this first invocation. Uh, in our, our case, um, the first two parameters indicate that A and B should not be transposed. Then the next three parameters are matrix dimensions, M and K in general, and it's lead, uh, then matrix A and its leading dimension, B its leading dimension, then uh, beta, which is zero, C and its leading dimension. And next, uh, uh, second invocation of C plus DGM calculates C times B, which is A times B times A really. So we achieve our, our goal, but you see how the 1MKL C API is used. The second example is similar, but it uses the uh, the MKL DPC++ uh, interface, this time with unified shared memory. And again, we calculate uh, the same product A times B times A. And once more, we define the matrix sizes, but this time we also set up a GPU queue denoted by the capital letter Q. <clears throat> and we uh, allocate uh, space for matrices A, B, C, and D using the uh, the malloc shared uh, call this time. The CPU GPU accessible unified shared memory uh, is, is allocated using this function and its first parameter is the required size. And the second parameter is the queue we set up earlier. And next we invoke the uh, blast gem function identical to the previous one, only using the different API in this case. Its parameters are similar, except that the first argument is now the device queue. The two matrix matrix multiplications are performing the same queue, but the second one has to wait for the first one to complete before it can proceed. And this is ensured by using the return value E1 from the first call as an optional parameter here in the second call, which enables waiting for the first one to complete in order for the second one to proceed. The third example is similar to the previous one in that it is using the MKL, the one MKL DPC++ interface, again, with the unified, with unified, unified shared memory, only that in this case, we want to calculate D equals A times B plus uh, times A using more than one tile on our GPU, at least two tiles if available. Tiles are subdivisions of, of a GPU with similar compute capabilities. So using more of them when available to speed up computation. We also want to use implicit scaling where we want to let the mass or performance libraries we use to do the partitioning of the work for us without any uh, need for us to make any changes in the code and indeed, if you look at the code, compare the code on this slide and the previous slide, you will notice that they are identical. Automatic dispatch of threads and memory on the two tiles is handled by the runtime. There is one change to make, however, and that is not in the co code of the, uh, the application, but it's in setting up our GPU environment before running our application. For using uh, more tiles, we need to uh, ex set, up, set up and export environment variables, enable Walker partition and enable static partitioning. Enable Walker partition enables uh, scaling on one or two more tiles of a GPU. And the second one ensures that the workload will be divided into partitions during dispatch. Uh, the fourth example is using uh, also 
DPC++, uh, DPC++ interface, but with explicit scaling this time. And this example, we simplified it a little bit by calculating just A times B, but the example is complicated by the fact that we use explicit scaling. So the user needs to handle the memory and work partitioning by creating one queue per tile. Allocation and computation are done per tile. And um, it should be noted that one MKL does not have a multi GPU API, API similar to what we have for multi tile uh, scaling, explicit scaling. And therefore, if you want to use explicit scaling on multiple GPUs, the user needs to handle the memory and work partitioning for each GPU. And finally, the fifth example is for using one MKL OpenMP offload interfaces. The code looks almost as it does for a classic C API, but we are using two devices here. We split matrices A and C. If you look at this pragma here, A and C are split in two halves and use OpenMP pragmas to distribute the work evenly to tile zero for these two devices. So the first pragma we use here is to send data to device number DNAM. DNAM can be zero or one in this case. And then we use the second pragma to um, dispatch to request C blast DGEM execution on tile zero of each device number DNAM. And no wait here, no wait tells uh, uh, that uh, asynchronous calls to G blast DGEM are okay. Uh, and uh, device, when you use device and sub device, we just specify which device and which sub device to run on uh, the MKL computation. The next four slides, and these will go over very quickly, just illustrate performance for selected functions for some of the MKL subdomains. We'll just glance quickly at them. The first example is for vector mass, the vector mass exponential function. And it's for four data types, 32-bit real, 64-bit real, 32-bit complex, 64-bit complex floating point. In each case, we have three implementations, high accuracy, low accuracy and enhanced performance with errors respectively of at most one unit in the last place, four units in the last place, and many units in the last place for enhanced performance, but um, loss of accuracy is tolerated by some applications. So each application should make its best trade-off in this case, which one, which variant to use. Performance is uh, reported here in clock cycles per element. So lower is faster. Similar performance and accuracy data is posted for all vector mass functions on the software.intel.com website. The second example is similar for uh, vector RNGs performance, but in this case, we report that relative to the C RAND function, higher is better here. A single thread speeds up the computation about 215 times, or no, 21.5 times. And 38 threads, 76 threads on a, an Ice Lake processor with 38 cores speeds that up by 471 times. The third example illustrates how LA PAC computations scale with a problem size from 2000 to 20,000 problem sizes when using 38 threads, again, dark blue or 78 threads, light blue on a 38 core Ice Lake processor. The first function uh, used to illustrate this here is uh, computing the, uh, the LU factorization of a matrix. And the second one computes the Cholesky factorization of a real symmetric positive definite matrix. And finally, this last example shows performance uh, scaling for gem calculations for integer 8 and integer, integer 16 data types, also on a 38 uh, Ice Lake core CPU. Ice Lake CPU. Performance is shown in gigaflops here. So again, higher is better and it's best when using 76 threads. Uh, this next to last slide is uh, just showing uh, the support that one API has across the industry and academia. Many organizations is, uh, and, and industry players support it and uh, in no particular order, some of them are listed here. You can take a look. And the last slide is just 
listing a few resources you can use to learn more about One API and about One MKL. And this concludes uh, my presentation. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. Okay, thank you. Mauritius, Mauritius. Um, we're at time, unless there's a very quick question, but I don't wanna break into the uh, um, next session. Yes. And, and uh, so the one question that is here is uh, by Alfredo. They have a code that does lots of benefit from being able to do partial FFTs in internal dimensions, which FFT supports, but MKL FFT does not. Other plans for that in the future? Uh, I, I, I honestly do not, do not know. I, I don't believe so. I, I might have heard of that. So, um, if there is a request, uh, we, we can contact us and ask if it's, if it's important, uh, we, we may consider that, but uh, let us know. So we often add features to one MKL domains based on, on demand and uh, necessity and whether it's uh, useful to anyone in the user space. Okay. Alfredo says, uh, let's talk. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, send, send, send an email, please. Thank you um, for this. Thank you. Great talk, Marius. And I'm going to hand it over back to Alvaro for the next part of the program. Mauro, uh, Alvaro, 